psychological addiction is a bigger problem than physical addiction. Physical addiction goes away after not too long of a period of time, particularly with heroin, you detox. You feel really bad for a while, but once that's over, it's the psychological aspect. It's what, what is it about life that I can't cope with sober? You know, what is it that makes life so challenging for me that I am willing to go to these lengths to feel differently? Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 319. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, our featured guest is Eric Zimmer. He's a dad, serial entrepreneur, podcast host, behavior coach, and author. He's endlessly inspired by the quest for a greater understanding of how our minds work and how to intentionally create the lives we want to live. At the age of 24, Eric was homeless, addicted to heroin, and facing long jail sentences. In the years since, he has found a way to recover from addiction and build a life worth living for himself. Eric's story and his work have been featured in the media, including TEDx, Mind Body Green, Elephant Journal, the BBC, and Brain Pickings. It was so great to have Eric on the show sharing his very personal story with addiction. Jesse and I have been listening to his podcast many times over the years, and he is truly an excellent interviewer, delivers amazing content, and he has the best voice. So Jesse and Eric get into an amazing conversation today, and here is some of what they talk about. Eric's struggle with alcohol and drugs, physical addiction versus psychological addiction, strategies to fight depression, maintaining community and connections, finding balance with work, the importance of hobbies outside of work, and how to start where you are right now. Lots of great stuff. Excited for you guys to hear this. Here we go with Eric Zimmer. Hello, Eric. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Excited to chat with you, and we have a lot to get into. You have a really profound story, a lot of ups and downs, and I really want to take our time here and go through that. And I actually want to go all the way back to when you were a kid. So take us all the way back to being a kid. What were you like? I was in trouble a lot as a kid is what I was like. You know, I think from starting about the age of nine, I was just in trouble. I was a shoplifter. I was a vandal. I was a break into places. I was just, I was kind of was always in trouble. And I don't really know why, but I don't think it was a very happy kid. And if I, if I sort of extrapolate to my later adult years, I think that that was a way that made me feel sort of more connected and alive. I think as a kid, I was a challenge. I was a very, I guess the term they used in those days was a gifted kid. I was in you know, all the gifted classes. I was studied by a psychologist at one point because of how far ahead I was in reading and different things. So I was a gifted but troubled kid for sure. You grew up in Columbus, Ohio? I did, yeah. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Yep, younger brother and a younger sister. So you kind of alluded to the trouble that ended up becoming later on in life. I know that involves alcohol and drugs. When did you start dabbling into that realm? Relatively late by a lot of people's standards. You know, I probably started maybe dabbling as a sophomore in high school. I drank sort of strangely then, but not a lot. And then my junior and senior year in high school, I had I founded a nonprofit program where we provided tutoring for disadvantaged children, took high school students and provided tutoring for disadvantaged children. When I saw what was happening in those children's lives with drugs and alcohol from their family members, I just sort of swore it all off. So I dabbled a little at 16 and then I didn't touch any of it again until I was 18. But when I did, when I was 18, it was like I was off to the races. I started drinking and I, I feel like I rarely drew a sober breath again for six, seven years. What was the first thing you got into? Alcohol? Yeah. Okay. And then at this time, I'm assuming you were hanging out with a lot of friends that were into this kind of behavior? One friend mainly. Actually, most of my friends were not particularly, but I met a friend and, and he was and we became very close. But yeah, I was certainly hanging around friends. Yes, I wasn't doing it alone at that point in my life. I know at one point you actually moved from Ohio to San Francisco to sober up. So what age were you when this happened? Goodness, you've done your research. I think I was 20 when I did that. It didn't work. I got to San Francisco and I think my first night there, I remember sort of coming to, I was a, you know, I was a blackout drinker and I remember coming to on a park bench 
in San Francisco. And I just remember being like, I don't even know where I'm at. At least in Columbus, I could be like, oh, I got some sense of where I was. And I was totally disoriented. So nothing changed out there. I, you know, I obviously brought myself, which was the problem. How long did you end up staying there? I was there for a couple of years, probably. When did you begin getting involved with heavier drugs? Well, I think not too long after I started drinking, I started with pot and, you know, I dabbled in LSD and mushrooms. I don't think it was till I got back from California that I started getting into heavier drugs. Like with alcohol, once I started, it seemed to all happen very fast. I did cocaine some, that was never really my thing. But once I tried heroin, that very quickly became kind of like the new addiction for me. When these were new addictions at the time, did you realize right away you had a problem or did it take time to really process that? I think as an alcoholic or addict, you go through various stages of realization. I think I had a realization. I mean, I moved to San Francisco because I kind of thought I had a problem, right? So even then I had some sense that something wasn't right. The way I drank was different, that it was problematic. That stuff sort of kind of comes in and out of consciousness and denial is really strong. And so I think it took me till I got sober to fully, really get the problem and the depth of the problem. So I think it was kind of an ongoing process. You know, in those days, as I started to get sober, I thought the problem was that I was physically addicted to heroin. I thought that was the problem. And while that is an unpleasant situation to be physically addicted to a drug and have to go through withdrawal, for me, it was definitely the smallest part of the problem. So I would say that it was a growing awareness of the problem and how big of a problem it was over all that time and my willingness to actually look at it and face it. I think I'd have moments where I was like, this is really bad. And then I just dive back in and not think about it for a while. Did you have a spiritual practice at that time? Nope. You mentioned the physical problem being the smaller part of the issue when you're addicted. What was the bigger issue? I mean, I think psychological addiction is a bigger problem than physical addiction. Physical addiction goes away after not too long of a period of time, particularly with heroin, you detox. You feel really bad for a while, but once that's over, it's the psychological aspect. It's what, what is it about life that I can't cope with sober? You know, what is it that makes life so challenging for me that I am willing to go to these lengths to feel differently? You know, drugs and alcohol for people are usually an answer for a period of time, right? The reason that people get so wrapped up in them is for certain people, they're a real answer to feeling bad, you know, to not feeling good. And feeling bad can be all different manners of things. It can be depression. It can be people, you know, trauma increases your risk of being an addict so greatly. So trauma and depression and all kinds of mental illness and other factors. So those things are all still there. You take the chemical away and what you've basically got is the person who had all that problem and now they don't have the crutch they've been leaning on. And so for me, that's always been the bigger issue. I, um, I stayed sober about eight years at that point off heroin. And after about eight years, I started drinking again and I drank for a few years. I quit that. I guess I've been sober now completely for another 13 years or so. But when I got sober at 24, I was a homeless heroin addict and I was you know, I was staring 30 to 40 years of jail time down. I had hepatitis C. I was dying. When I got sober off alcohol 10 years later or 12 years later, I was living in a nice house, driving a nice car, had just gotten the best promotion I'd ever gotten. Inside, I was just as sick both times, I think. It's just looked very different outside. But what was happening internally was no different either of those times for me. So that's kind of what I mean. Before the first time you got sober, I know you were a cook in a restaurant and you tell a story of when police actually came to that restaurant and they ended up handcuffing you, arresting you, and you describe it as a cold, rainy night, just very dark. Was this the whole turning point to getting sober the first time? It was. It was the big turning point. We tend to think of it as the moment that it happened. And, you know, and I think there's a lot of moments that led up to that moment. I had tried several times before that. I had been to treatment before that and tried to get sober and it hadn't worked. But this sort of kicked off a series of events that in retrospect turned out to be what it was that, you know, got me sober for an extended period of time. And, uh, you know, those jail sentences were a stark wake up call. And, you know, we talk a lot about a bottom in recovery and, and that certainly was a bottom, but I don't think a bottom is the only thing that's important in recovery. I think you need a bottom and at the same time, what you need coming along, you know, at the same moment is some degree somehow of hope and support. 
And for me, that's when those two things sort of came together, both sort of a moment of crisis and then a moment of support. I would say the more critical turning point to me as I think back on it was I went into detox after I was arrested, largely because I was going to be really sick from drugs. And, I, and when I got arrested, I lost all the money and I just couldn't get drugs anymore. The van I'd been living in was gone. And so I went into detox because I had no better idea. And in detox, they asked me, they said, we think you need to go to our 28-day program upstairs. And I said, I don't think so. There's no way I'm going to go do that. And I went back to my room and I had sort of a moment of clarity where I went, I think I'm going to die if I go back out there. And so I went and said, okay, I'm willing to go to that program. And for me, that felt like a really big turning point right then because I made a serious commitment to getting better at that point. Your support at that point, was it AA? Yeah. Well, my support at that point was, you know, like I said, I went into a, a longer detox program where they exposed us to AA and NA. And then when I got out, it was AA. And then I actually went into a halfway house for a while. But AA was sort of the underlying support kind of through all of that. It was the mechanism by which I got sober, for sure. It was the biggest contributor, probably. Not to say treatment and a halfway house weren't. And you talk about how that time when you finally went into recovery and it worked for you, having hope and that being part of the working solution at that time. When you were facing such a dark time, what did you find hope in? I think it was that it's what makes 12-step programs great. There's a lot of things about them that people don't like. They don't work for everybody. There's, we can find lots of fault if we want, and I do sometimes. But what I could do is I could go into a meeting any day and I could see people who would say, like, I was like you, and now look at my life. I'd see that day after day after day after day, and I'd start to go, huh, well, if that happened for them, maybe that can happen for me. I think I started to get hope from meetings and being in, in treatment was really good because I had, I had a structure. It was like, do this, then do this, then do that. And all day long, what I was doing was focusing on my recovery. And I think that helped clear my head out a little bit also. So I think as my brain cleared a little bit and I had time to think, I was able to see hope that maybe was there before, but I just wasn't, I wasn't feeling it or getting it. When you were going through recovery, did you pick up any tools or strategies along the way? or do any reading or have any profound influences that led to new strategies for you? I don't even know how to answer that question because the whole overhaul of the way I thought and viewed the world and interacted with it, it was all a big change and overhaul. So it's hard for me to say like, oh, there was a little strategy here or a little thing there. It was a pretty big overhauling of, of how I viewed the world and what I did. And so, I mean, I could talk about it for hours. So I'm not quite sure how to answer that question succinctly. <laughs> right. I guess what I'm getting at, part of it at least, is did you have any specific things like meditation or amping up your sleep routine or changing your diet around and eating a clean diet? Things that while you're getting this support, and going through this process that facilitated, you know, a greater sense of well-being. Not at that time, I didn't. I think those things are all very wise and they're a big part of my recovery now. But at that time, not particularly. At that point, I was praying, which we could consider a form of meditation, but not what we would think of as sitting down and being actually quiet. I'm not sure what sitting down being quiet my mind would have been like in those days. Like I said, I went to a halfway house where I ate terrible food, I'm sure, for six months. You know, my focus then really was go to meetings, talk to my sponsor, pray, don't drink. Go to meetings, talk to my sponsor, pray, don't drink. Over, 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 over. And that's really kind of what, what I did. Like I said, it was kind of an overhaul of the more important thing. Not that all those things aren't important and useful. The more important thing for me was sort of an overhaul of the way that I perceived the world and what was happening. And that largely happened by going to AA meetings and reading recovery literature and hearing people and talking about it and sharing about it and just, you know, working the steps in AA. The steps are sort of a transformative program. And so I think that for me was what kind of was the big piece of it. As I stayed sober a little bit longer, then these things like health and diet and exercise, and I started to realize how those were really important to my overall well-being. And I think in order to stay sober long term, we have to have a pretty high quality of life. And I think those things all now are huge components to me of my recovery, particularly as I've gotten sober 
And then I've had to go deal with like what's underlying some of that depression has been a big one for me. And the three things, you know, or four things you mentioned, meditation, exercise, eating well, sleeping well, those are all big components of my strategy to fight depression, which in turn is a strategy to stay sober for sure. What's your diet looking like these days? I don't know that it has an exact title. I'm a vegetarian, so there's that part of it. Although I have been eating fish occasionally, so I guess I'm a pescatarian. I try and avoid processed foods, eat an awful lot of vegetables, use really good high quality oils and fats and make things that are really good. I'm very lucky my girlfriend is a wonderful cook and a wonderful, super healthy cook. So I, I just kind of end up with pretty often really healthy, really delicious things showing up in front of me. So I'm extremely lucky, but I'd say that's the components of it. Avoid as much sugar as I can, processed food, lots of vegetables, good fats, you know, not getting sunflower or safflower oil or, and, and avoiding things that are generally not real good for me. I can totally relate with my wife, Marnie, being a chef and a nutritionist. So I end up having a lot of great food coming down the pipe as well. And I'm so grateful for that. Yeah, me too. Every day I feel grateful for it because it's just, it has made it easy for me to eat at a level that I never really used to be able to pull off on my own. Yeah, I'm very grateful for it. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Eric to give a shout out to our show partner, Spruce. Spruce's collagen creamer and the marine collagen have been staples for me during my pregnancy as it's ensuring that I'm getting really good quality protein and some good quality fat in my body. And the collagen creamer is absolutely delicious. It's pretty plain on its own, but when you mix it into any kind of hot beverage, whether it's with turmeric or matcha or chocolate or even coffee, it just brings that whole drink to life. And if you want a little extra dose of collagen, put some marine collagen or even their grass-fed collagen in there to get an extra boost of protein. These are two products that I've been loving and I highly recommend you getting your hands on. They are amazing. And collagen is just known to be so helpful for the skin in general, your hair, your nails, and it's super nourishing to your joints and it helps combat inflammation. So these are ingredients you definitely want to get in your body on a regular basis. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off the whole Spruce lineup by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash spruce. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash spruce. And spruce is spelled S-P-R-O-O-S. Other great news, if you spend $40 or more, you get free shipping. Go and put your order in with Spruce today. These are high quality products that Marnie and I love. And now a shout out from other show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. We love all the products from Beekeepers Naturals, but there's some that really stand out. And what Jesse and I have done is we put together an ultimate health bundle. And what this bundle has is their bee-powered superfood honey, which is amazing and so loaded with goodness. We also included the raw bee pollen, which we love combining into our smoothies or chia bowls, or we just eat it plain or straight up. And also the bee elixir brain fuel. So you can get all of these and you're going to save an extra 25% off. You're going to get such a good deal by getting these products together and you're going to be getting the products that Jesse and I love most. So I highly encourage you to go ahead and check out this bundle. So as a listener of our show, like Marnie said, you get 25% off that bundle or in general, anything on their website, you get 15% off. And to take advantage of this discount, all you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. If you live in North America and you spend $60 or more, you get free shipping. We love the whole lineup of beekeepers and we know you will too. Go and check it out. And now back to our chat with Eric. When did you make the switch to becoming a vegetarian slash pescatarian? The pescatarian switch has been in the last four months or so. So before that, it was probably five years of being a straight vegetarian. I started it at about three months into when we did the podcast and we had a guest on who's kind of well known for his vegan diet and endurance work, Rich Roll. And, um, you know, I kind of read his book like I do for every guest. I read their book and he sort of said like a 30, you know, challenge, do it for 30 days and see what you think. 
And so I did a whole food, plant-based, vegan diet for 30 days and never really went back to eating meat. I did go back. I'm not fully vegan. I try and minimize other animal products, but I don't fully. But I never went back to eating meat. It just, for whatever reason, the desire to do it left me during that period and really has never been hard for me to do since. It just kind of happened. You touched on this a little bit earlier, Eric, where... You were sober for a number of years and then dipped back into, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but I know the substance was alcohol. Yep. So can you talk about what happened there? Yeah, alcohol and a copious amount of marijuana (laughs) also were my two things during that period. Yeah, I mean, I think what happened was a few things. One is I drifted away from AA, which is not necessarily always a bad thing, but I didn't really fill it with anything else. And I became very, very focused only on myself. Everything became about how do I feel? And for me, that's a real recipe to getting mentally sick. When what I care about most is how do I feel all the time? I don't do so well. I do much better when I try and orient myself towards caring about others and what's happening in others' lives and and seeing a bigger, broader picture than myself. So I started doing that you know, and I started engaging in behaviors that were not so healthy. Like I started smoking occasionally. You know, I had managed to become a heroin addict with never smoking a cigarette. Like it's just something I never did. And then here I am, you know, occasionally smoking and I was more promiscuous and wasn't living in the way that I had learned to live in recovery. And then one day my brother told me that he had been drinking for about six months and everything was fine. And my brother came into recovery about a year after me, also a heroin addict. And when he said he was doing fine, it kind of was sort of the last straw for me where I went, huh, maybe I'm not an addict. And, and I kind of looked at it and I went, you know, I was young then. I was doing heroin, which is a terrible idea, right? Everybody knows that's a bad idea. I've done so much work now. I've been through so much recovery. I've been through so much therapy. I exercise well. I have a good job. I make all these really good decisions in my life. So I can just do the same thing with alcohol. I'll just make good decisions about it. And, you know, the fact that I got sober again is an indication that it didn't work out so well. So that's kind of how it happened. I just sort of walked away from the things that had helped me to stay sober and sort of walked into the sort of things that that are not so good for me. And it sort of became inevitable that sooner or later I took a drink. How long did you end up swaying away from your path? I don't know exactly because I'm bad at keeping track of time, but I think about three years. Then I sobered up again and have been sober since. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. At this point, with all the work you've done and you had this one quote unquote slip up along the recovery pathway, do you ever worry about slipping up again or it's so far in the past now that you're you're feeling very comfortable that you're steering away from drugs and alcohol now for life? I would say I feel comfortable. I feel quote unquote recovered. And I also feel like drugs and alcohol are a very formidable opponent. And so I don't really underestimate them. I look pretty closely at, you know, how am I doing? If I notice that I'm wanting a drink a little bit, or even not even wanting one, but starting to notice it, if I go out to eat and I notice everybody's drinking wine and I have the thought like, huh, that would be nice. Or, you know, I start thinking about marijuana. I kind of use that as a sign to sort of go, huh, all right, how am I doing? Because normally it's just like that stuff doesn't really exist to me. I see it, but I don't see it. It has no emotional pull on me. It has the emotional pull on me that like sausages would have to somebody who doesn't like sausage. Like, well, there's a sausage over there. No big deal. But as soon as I start going, huh, look at that. That looks kind of good. Then I sort of check back in with myself and try and see kind of what's going on with me. And I work a pretty vigorous recovery program. I don't think we wouldn't call it that in AA because I don't go to meetings anymore. But I've incorporated all the things that I think AA gave me into my life. And so they're just kind of woven into the fabric of my life. And I think that keeps me pretty protected. So I don't anticipate ever doing it again, but I never say never to anything. If I started living in a different way, I, I, you know, I believe it's right there. You talked about how when you notice yourself starting to, in a small way, go off course, you might start to notice different things like alcohol or, or different things out there. And when you come and check back in at that point, What are some of the things that you're noticing in your life that maybe are starting to slip? Is it things like sleep or does your diet slip or exercise or meditation? Are there certain things that you can, you know, quickly look back at your lifestyle and realize I got to tighten this up? Sometimes, sometimes it is a lifestyle thing. 
you know, same thing with depression. When, when depression sort of shows back up, I kind of go, all right, how am I doing on those things? And, you know, exercise is probably the biggest one to me, but so is, you know, so is sleep, so is diet. So sometimes that's what it is. And other times it's a psychological process. There is a, you know, I think the big one for me, like I said, is what is my perspective like? When my perspective is kind of broad and I'm thinking in non-absolute terms, like I'm not really focused on small things, I'm thinking broadly, I'm thinking about other people, then I tend to be healthier. But when I start to get really myopic about something, I tend to start to get a little less well, right? When I start to really be like, okay, how are the monthly downloads this month? And I think that's like the most important thing. Or how's the cash flow this month? I'm really worried about the cash flow this month, right? When that starts to become what takes up the bulk of my attention, or even sometimes like how do I feel takes up the bulk of my attention. That's the motion for me that's not so helpful. And so, you know, my spiritual practice as a whole is this broadening of perspective. It's this flowing outwards of wider consciousness, broader consciousness, flowing out of kindness, flowing out of love. And for me, when I'm not doing well, it's more of an imploding. Everything starts turning inwards, right? How am I doing? What's happening with me? You know, very small minded. That's sort of a broad barometer of how, how I'm doing. But the physical stuff is part of it. One of the things in AA that I learned very early on that I think is so important is this idea they say, halt, don't get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And those things are really good because early in recovery or really any time, if you're any of those things, it can really make you think that what you want is a drink when really what you need is a nap or something to eat. And so, you know, physicality is a big part of it also. Well, you talked about when you notice your scope is getting focused in on yourself or things that you don't necessarily think are healthy for you to focus in on, broadening that. And I'm just curious what you do in that situation when you notice yourself getting really zoomed in and, and it's time to, you know, start thinking of other people and start broadening that perspective. Yeah, I think a variety of things. I mean, one of the things that's good about the job I have, right, is every week I interview somebody, usually, you know, psychologist, an author, a spiritual teacher about these sort of ideas. And so my job sort of naturally helps pull me out a little bit. I do coaching work with a lot of people. And so that naturally pulls me out into paying attention to them. I turn back to like gratitude. You know, how can I be more grateful for what I actually really have and really spend time thinking about it? I turn back to kindness. How can I kind of go out of my way to be kinder to people than I'm being? Where can I find opportunities to give out kindness? I turn towards reading things I read that make me feel more expansive. Like you said, I check, you know, where's my meditation practice? Where are all these other things? But those are some of the main things that I do, or I talk to people about it. I kind of share how I'm feeling, what's going on. Do you stay well connected with your kids? As much as a 22-year-old or 21-year-old wants to be connected to his father. <laughs> my son's 21. He's a sophomore in, or junior in college. So yes, I feel very connected to him and, and I love him. I mean, I think any parent at the stage I'm at is like, I wish I had more time with him. I wish we talked more than we do. But I also recognize like that's a totally natural development. So yes, I stay as connected to him as he seems to want to be. So we've talked about your podcast. It's come up a couple times. And I'm just curious, how did this whole thing start? All right. Long version is I started a solar energy company. A few years after getting sober, I just was like, okay, I want to start a solar energy company. And I did it, you know, kind of as a side hustle for a long time. But we made, you know, we made a, a lot of progress. And, you know, we had you know, a year where we did over a million dollars in sales. And we had another year where we were, you know, we had about $10 million in signed contracts. The state of Ohio rolled back some incentives it was offering for energy and all those contracts went up in smoke. We kind of picked ourselves back up off the ground, rebuilt, and got to a point where we had about $15 million in signed contracts that were, we had outside investors who were coming in for. And then the legislature in Ohio yet again started rolling back legislation they had passed. The second time it happened, it kind of broke my heart and I just went, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to continue to spend this much time and energy on something that is fundamentally out of my control like that. Like I can do all this really good work and have it wiped away 
instantly by political whim. And I'd never done anything that was like that before. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to create an online course for how you develop large solar projects, because that was kind of our expertise. And in those days, it was, there weren't a lot of people that had that expertise. So that sort of got me thinking about online marketing, which sort of led me to listening to podcasts. And, you know, so it kind of got me in that space. And eventually I just sort of decided, like, I didn't even want to build that course. Like I was just done, kind of done with solar and I shut it all down. And so I was kind of bored, I guess. Right. I mean, I had a full time job. I was I was doing consulting work, but I didn't have anything I was doing that was like my thing. I felt kind of bored. I don't know where really where it came from. One day the idea kind of showed up like, oh, I could do a podcast where I interview people about these things and I could call it this and I could use that parable and I could ask my best friend, Chris, who's an audio engineer, if he wants to do it with me and it'll allow us to spend more time together. And I just sort of did it because it sounded fun and because I thought, you know what, if I interview somebody every week and I read these books every week, like it's going to help my own mind state. I wasn't in the best mind state then. I was sober. I had been staying sober. I was in a very difficult marriage at that point. I just wasn't in the best place mentally. And so I sort of did it all. So it sounded fun. I wanted to spend more time with my friend. And I thought, you know what, this would be really good for me. And it turned out to be really, really good for me. Did you find right away when you got started, you had a real passion for it? Yeah, I loved it. Right from the beginning, it was, I was all fired up about it. <laughs> you know, I've been doing it long enough now, you can't sustain that level of enthusiasm for, it's about six years since we started the process. We didn't release our first episode till January, it'd be six months of the podcast actually being in the world. But we started in, in September, six years ago. So yes, I had a great passion for it. It was, I loved it. I still love it, but I was over the moon with it for a long time. We're coming up on five years this September for the show, and I totally love it as well. Like, you know, it's not something I could have ever pictured myself getting into leading up to it. But now that I'm doing it, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. It's just incredible connecting with people and, and learning. And I could keep going on and on. I share the same feeling. It was such a departure for me from anything I had ever done before or thought of doing. And very soon after I started doing it, I was like... I don't know that I believe we're meant to do certain things like a grand cosmic plan, but I went, this is a really good marriage of my talents and interests. You know, it's a really strong congruence between those things. And then it went well, right? We, you know, we started building an audience, which was really sort of the unexpected part of it all. So you mentioned that you're doing the podcast with your friend, Chris, and you guys are actually both musicians. Yes, we are. Part of what you guys do at the show, which is really cool, is you guys create your own music for the opening. And there's a couple of breaks throughout the show where you're getting to put your creations in the music realm out to the world as well. Yeah, it's fun. The opening music is us. Now we recorded that once, you know, a long time ago. But yeah, each break, we have two breaks where we just, you know, take a short break. And sometimes that's when ads will come or whatever. But each of those music breaks is an original creation by one of us or both of us. Sometimes we create them together. Sometimes an individual does them. Yeah. So that's a part of it I really like is that we do those. It gives me a outlet for music that's kind of fun. When did your passion for music take off? I learned to play the guitar when I was 18. Um, my passion for music probably started when I was, I mean, I think I loved it from a young age, but really, really took off when I was probably 15 and I discovered punk rock. I think that was the, that was the moment for me where I just really became deeply, deeply passionate about music. But I learned to play at 18. Throughout the years, do you think this was something that kind of kept you tied into the drugs and alcohol, that whole scene and, and performing with different bands and such? I think it's a convenient, this is a stronger word than I mean, excuse. It is real that most of that world, particularly being in a rock band like I was, that a lot of that world, there's a lot of drugs and alcohol. And it was a huge part of what I did. But after I got sober, you know, I put together a band with people who were sober and played more and wrote more music and wrote more songs and did better work than I'd ever done before. So it's a hard world to exist in as a sober person, right? Because it's just, there's not, you know, most of the places you play are bars. But I was able to kind of go back to it and play out and play in the same bars and the same clubs and do it sober. So they are compatible, but it does take, it, it can be challenging. I know right now the podcast is only part of your business. You're also doing some coaching. And I'm just curious, long term, would you like to just be doing the podcast? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we'll continue to offer things that take the ideas and concepts that we talk about 
in the podcast and make them accessible to listeners in more of a way that they can take advantage of and apply some of the things we talk about. So maybe it won't always be one-on-one coaching. Maybe it'll be group coaching. Maybe it'll be online courses. Maybe it'll probably be a combination of all those things. But I don't see it just being the podcast because I love the actual work with people. I get a lot of satisfaction from that. And so I think that's part of what we'll continue to do probably in some form or other. That's the plan anyway. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Eric to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. If you don't have Organifi's green juice powder yet, you've got to get your hands on it. This is such a great way to start your day, get your body nice and alkalized. It's great for detoxification, boosts your immune system, helps you to burn fat, And it is just absolutely delicious because it's got coconut water powder in there, a whole bunch of superfoods, and you just need to add water. So it's very simple to make and it's very easy to drink. So if you haven't tried the green juice powder yet, get your daily dose of greens in with this beautiful blend. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. This green juice powder complements any healthy diet and definitely should be a staple in your home. Go and give it a try today. And now a shout out from other show partner, Perfect Keto. We are so lucky to have access to companies who are making such good products and Perfect Keto has really nailed Their Perfect Keto Bars, which are loaded with protein from collagen, lots of healthy fats, including MCT oil and almond butter, and they've nailed the flavor. And one of their newest flavors, the Cinnamon Roll, is so good. Jesse and I love keeping them in the fridge and having them cold. They make a great snack. And you can, of course, bring them with you on the go. You can just have them at home when you're sitting in the afternoon and you need a little fix or even for an evening snack. So if you haven't tried the Perfect Keto Bars yet, I highly recommend you try them. They come in a variety of flavors, but the cinnamon roll definitely stands out. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your first Perfect Keto purchase, so make it a great one. And to take advantage of that incredible deal, all you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. On top of that, Perfect Keto ships worldwide, and if you live in the U.S., you get free shipping. Right after recording this ad, I'm actually going to go and grab myself a Perfect Keto bar. We have an interview coming up soon. I'm going to get fueled up. I love these bars. I know you will too. And now back to our chat with Eric. You guys have an online community that's thriving. How important was this since the beginning to make this part of the whole brand? That's a challenge because I believe community is hugely important. And I believe that there's an awful lot of people, a lot of our listeners who do not have community where they can share these ideas and talk with other people about them and get support for them. That said, I have felt like we have not figured out how to do it well yet online. We have made attempts at it. We've done little things, but I feel like we haven't cracked that nut really well yet. We've got a Facebook group and and I love the Facebook group. And when somebody comes forward and shares that they're struggling, the group is really sort of there to support them. But it's not as consistent, meaningful and deep a community as I wish we were building. We've tried some smaller groups and we've had some success there, but building online community is challenging. And so it's something we're going to continue to try and do. But I feel like we're still learning. I think a lot of people who have built some sort of audience, you guys may have a a similar thing. I don't know, feel like, how do we translate this into deeper and more meaningful relationships for people? It's just sort of challenging. And it's not only online. I think building community, even in real life, is a challenge thing. Our lives are all so busy that community everywhere is suffering. And yet it seems to be what people need so much. So we continue to invest in trying to figure out how to make that happen. You know, we're doing more in-person things. You know, we've got some workshops I've led in Columbus and Cleveland. I'm doing a workshop at Omega in New York next year. So we're starting to branch out that way also. But yeah, community is something I want to solve, but I don't know if we have yet. It's a really long answer. (laughs) In a personal way, how do you make sure, Eric, that you're surrounding yourself around people that have similar ideas and a similar mission? And how do you maintain a thriving community of people, family and friends around you? 
I would say in my own life, this is probably the area also that I most feel like needs work and effort. I have some really good friends, but only two of them are in Columbus. The rest of them are kind of scattered around. So I talk to them a lot, but I don't see them a lot. And then it's further complicated because I split my time between Columbus and Atlanta because my girlfriend's mother is in Atlanta and her mother has Alzheimer's and we're live-in caregivers. So I'm between Atlanta and Columbus every two weeks. And so my attempts to foster more community have been a little bit more challenged. You know, the main thing I do is when I'm, particularly when I'm in Columbus, I just make sure that I am looking at my schedule for the week. I have to plan it further ahead than this, but I just reach out to the people in Columbus that matter to me and I plan time to see them. And I think about making sure I find time to do that. I think that's the big one for me is I make it important and I schedule the time to do it instead of just sort of going, well, let's see what happens. And so that's kind of the way we do it. But I, I feel like I'm, I'd am i like to grow more community than I have in places. But again, it's a little bit more challenging for us because we're kind of half time in both places. Right. I like that scheduling idea because especially as entrepreneurs, there's always something else that we can get pulled into with the work. And because we love what we do so much, we're always drawn towards it. And if we're not careful, you know, days go by, weeks go by, and it can be really hard to create that balance within our day to day. You know, it took me about four and a half years of doing the show and working a full time job before I was able to make this what I do full time. So about for about four and a half years, I worked a pretty demanding, you know, high level professional career. And I did this and I did coaching. I had no time to do anything. So when I finally was lucky enough to say, I'm going to leave that job behind. One of the things I said was like, I'm going to make sure that some of this extra time I have goes towards friendships and family and spending quality time. I'm not going to book it all back up with work. And so I made a real conscious effort to do that. And I'm glad I did because I, I actually finally had what felt to me like more time. It's good that you made a conscious effort and realized that at that time. Yeah, because I had not been getting nearly enough of it, as you can imagine, kind of that keeping that kind of schedule. Yeah. I mean, I have a similar story too, where I was a practicing chiropractor for a number of years when we started this show. And this started out just as a hobby and eventually evolved and evolved to what it is today. And for a number of years now, I've been lucky enough to be able to do this full time. And I'm just so grateful that, you know, I was able to transition and, and I just love what I do. And I think an important point in all this as well, and, and your story and my story both show this, that there might need to be a time where the balance might not be there. And there might be a time when we need to grind and need to work extra hard while we're starting to build something. Or when we go through different life circumstances like you're doing right now, where you have a health challenge in the family and you're needing to travel back and forth between two different states, you know, it's a lot. And there's different times in our life when we need to just really be prepared to grind. Yeah, there are. There are for sure. And I think it's a matter of knowing how much grinding you can really do before you fall apart. I think it's really important to look at what am I sacrificing to do this? And just being clear. And so, you know, it's why we spend two weeks a month in Atlanta taking care of her mother, not four weeks a month, because four weeks a month living with uh, her mother who has Alzheimer's might make us both insane. And we're lucky enough to be able to get some other care in for her. Yeah, there are points where we really do have to grind and balance isn't there. You know, I think balance is better looked at over a longer period of time. You know, and I think the other thing is like, what are you sacrificing? You know, we, we make heroics out of people like Steve Jobs, but, you know, I don't think... I don't think his daughter thinks a whole lot of him, right? And that's not a sacrifice I wanted to make. I wasn't willing to sacrifice a good relationship with my son really for anything. I'm not saying that that's the way everybody has to be. I'm saying it's worth thinking about what am I giving up to do this? Because we're always giving up something to do something else. So what choices are we making? And are we making the ones that are in line with what we really value? And sometimes the answer is yes. And for me, grinding on the podcast was, I loved it. So yes, it was work. And there were a lot of times I wish I didn't do it and could, you know, play more. But that work was so satisfying. It was giving me so much back as I did it that yes, it was a grind. But in other ways, it was also just a great deal of joy. And I'm sure it was similar for you. Exactly. And how do you think like even day to day now doing something you're so passionate about, how do you find that feeds into your well-being? I find it tricky now. 
and what I mean by that is in some ways it, it feeds into my well-being very much, right? Because I'm, I'm sort of in this world, right? Like I'm talking to you and then I'm going to interview somebody else and then, you know, I'm reading their work. And so I'm, I'm kind of immersed. So on one hand, it's really good for my overall well-being. What I've found, particularly, you know, in the last 15 months, 16 months, now that this is what I do full time, is that it adds an element of potential stress that I have to watch for so that I don't let that suck the joy out of something that I really enjoy doing. And so I'm sort of doing that dance right now. When I did this in addition to a full-time job, the money I made was just bonus, right? Just great, right? Because that's how I did it. But now, since this is what I do for a living, I have to pay attention to that. You know, my son's in college. I pay for his college. And that has made it for me where I need to really watch that I don't let the stress or the work aspect or the, the money aspect of it suck the joy out of the rest of it for me. So I'm learning that balance right now, I think, is one of the challenges I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do that well. And I think another challenge, too, when money comes into the picture is being true to the art. Because again, when this was just an extra bonus, the income you made from it, you weren't worried about the money and you could do it exactly the way you wanted to do it. And you didn't have to worry about revenue streams and how it was going to pay the bills. So do you ever stop back and look at things and see if you know things are changing because it's now your full-time gig? Yeah, I do. We're part of a podcast network who helps us sell our advertising, right? If I left it to them, we'd have double the number of ads in our show that we have probably, right? And that's tempting. That is tempting sometimes. Like, huh, you know, I could do that. You know, we could put one more ad in and that would be X amount per month and that might solve this problem. I do sort of watch that and try and stay true to what it was. I try and balance that like, okay, our listeners are our most valued asset, right? They're the most important thing to me. I don't want to drive them away. I don't want to turn them off. I don't want to make the show not as good as it can be because of that. So the strange thing about our show is it has not changed a whole lot in all this time. And I can never decide if that's a good or bad thing. The format has remained kind of largely what it's been. And that seems to be what resonates with people. So we sort of stick with it. So the art itself, you know, I think is interesting. I think it's a good point because I think about it like, well, should I change it? What should I do? So yeah, I do find myself always trying to think about like, okay, what's the answer that money is saying? And what's the, what I feel is the right answer. And, you know, we've had several things with our podcast network where we could have made a lot more money by doing some things that I did not feel right about. There was one point they wanted to put, you know, we've done 280 some episodes at this point. They wanted to put a big portion of that behind a paywall. You know, there was going to be a certain amount of money to do that. And I just eventually had to say, no, I'm not willing to do that. Even if it means our relationship ends and this podcast network is great for me, I told people this podcast would be free. It has to stay that way. Like that's the bottom line for me. That was like the real life version of this. Like there's a lot more money here. And A, they may say, if you don't do this, you can't be part of the network, which would have been really financially difficult for us. But I went, that goes too far. It is a dance that we have to figure out. We both have an outlet that's become our business and, and we make money doing it and we love doing it. But do you think it's important that we find other avenues to create art outside the realm of, of business? I think so. I can't speak for everybody. For me, yes. The fact that I can play guitar and make music is a big outlet for me. And once I finally years ago went, you know what? It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to turn into anything. It's just something I like to do. It's become an incredibly rewarding thing. And it doesn't get mixed up with anything else. It's just doing it because I like doing it. There are other things that I do. I mean, I've been looking at my life sort of going, where are things I can do that are just fun? that I don't turn into something I either have to be really good at or I make money at or whatever. And so for me, yes, it is important to have that. Yeah, doing something just for the sake of doing it. Yep, I think that is that is important. Eric, as somebody who has made huge changes in their behavior, going from various addictions to where you're at now, what would you say to somebody out there who, whether it be addiction, whether it be quote unquote something a lot smaller, but they're looking to make a behavior change, how do they start that? I think you start wherever you can. That's probably my biggest message is there's a quote from Arthur Ashe I love. I probably won't get it in the right order, but it's, you know, do what you can, use what you have, start where you are. 
And I love that quote because it really talks about just wherever you are, there is a path forward. It may not be a huge step, but take a step forward, then take another step forward, whether it's wanting to start a business or get exercising or meditating or beating an addiction. We can all start where we are. And that's the important thing is to start and then just keep taking small steps. I always say, you know, you'd be kind of amazed what a series of small steps taken over a long period of time turns into. It can be pretty remarkable. Each of those individual steps may not look like much, but you keep doing them and they really add up. So just start. Well, you actually recommend for people that when they do start to take small bites and take small steps and build momentum that way. I do. You know, it depends on the person, but in general, most of us bite off too much, right? We think, all right, I'm going to exercise. So I need to be at the gym six days a week for an hour. And that turns out to be more than most of us can really do to start. And so we end up then quitting. And so I'm a, I'm much more of a proponent of like one small step at a time. And Eric, last question for you. What does ultimate health mean to you? I think ultimate health for me is when physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health are all there. I've had to have all of those things for me to be truly healthy. At different points in my life, I've had one or two of those, but life is best for me when I really bring all of those things together. So for me, that's ultimate health. Love that. We're only as strong as our weakest link. Yeah. Yep. All right, Eric, other than the listeners going and checking out your podcast, The One You Feed, how can they connect with you after the show? Yeah, you can go to oneyoufeed.net. That's all spelled out, O-N-E-Y-O-U-F-E-E-D.net or ericzimmer.coach. All right, we're going to link those up over at ultimahealthpodcast.com. And Eric, really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story, being vulnerable, being real, and your true inspiration. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. You're a wonderful conversationalist. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Eric. You too. Take care. All right. Bye. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Eric. Lots of great takeaways and also just really insightful to hear his personal story and personal struggles. And if this episode landed with you, we would love for you to share with us over on Instagram. Be sure to tag Ultimate Health Podcast and one underscore you underscore feed, which is Eric's podcast. And another thing you can do is share this episode with a friend, family member, colleague, or someone that you know that might be struggling with addiction and could benefit from listening and hearing Eric's story. Thank you so much for your support, guys. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate you guys helping spread the word of the show. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 319. We have links there to everything we discussed in a show summary, so be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, we've been working with you for a long time. We love the work you do. Thank you. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that in December... Him and his wife are visiting San Francisco, Hawaii, Australia, Japan, Russia, and Spain. So they're literally going to be flying all the way around the world. And this fun fact was so incredible, I actually had to check in with Jace to make sure I was reading it properly. What an epic trip, safe travels, and have fun. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.